originally started because I wanted to like, be a professor. Um, but me by too. now, it's like, me too. yeah. <laughs> so, so, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Our Pirates, Arr, the second Our Pirates of the of the fall 2022 semester. Um, we're really excited that we we have a, as promised, we have a special topic tonight. Michael Liu is going to talk uh, talk about his what he did this summer. <laughs> Basically, I, I won't take anything away from him. I'll just let him explain everything. Um, and please feel free to ask questions as you go through. Uh, Michael's going to try to. He's got some material that he's got in slides, and he wants to show some code. He wants to yeah, get the app. Yeah, got, yeah, uh, I actually covered with the website. So I'll just turn it over to you, and while I grab some more pizza, I'll start after he finishes. Okay. But thank you very much for being yeah. here tonight. Okay, so hey everyone, my name is Michael, and uh, so this is my last semester as an undergrad here at RPI, uh, CS major, and <laughs> almost there. Uh, and this is the project that Dr. Erickson and I here worked on over the summer. Um, so it's the co-host floating solar project. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'll get into it. So first, uh, just some background information on floating solar. So uh, when Dr. Erickson just first uh, introduced me to the project, I had no idea what floating solar was. Uh, but as you can see on the picture on the right, it's just a very straightforward uh, thing. It's just these floating uh, solar panels on this body of water that people here are inspecting. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, green renewable energy that uh, everyone can generate if they find like an appropriate water reservoir. So uh, this is just some data that we have for the website floating solar installed on suitable water on suitable water reservoirs in the U.S. could generate about 10 percent of the nation's current annual electricity production. So what this means is that if local governments utilize the technology of floating solar appropriately, they can save a lot uh, on not only electricity bills, but they can also have other benefits associated with it. So here I just listed a few of them. Uh, the first one being the localization of power generation, followed by the reduction in terms of utility costs. And, uh, and because of the reduction in utility costs, municipalities that, imp that implement floating solar can reinvest the money, the money that they saved on electricity and other areas that could provide greater benefits to the communities. And lastly, during the process of implementing floating solar on certain communities, uh, this process creates opportunities for external companies to step in and, you know, uh, collaborate with the local government on some aspects of the project, but also creates opportunities for education. So myself here is just a perfect example of that. You know, had it not been co-host, uh, the Floating Solar Project and co-host, I would not have learned our shiny over the summer and also the whole data generation process with with R. So yeah, some benefits associated with the floating solar project. So now we'll go into co-host. Well, co-host. So what co-host did was that they're the first uh, local government in the U.S. to implement a self-operated and owned uh, floating solar project, and uh, as a result, they anticipate around half a million dollars in savings, uh, savings in electricity costs per year. Um, and this is just a news article that highlights. Uh, other than the already uh, anticipated savings in electricity, COHO's also got $750,000 uh, in federal grants for the successful implementation of this project. So, without, <laughs> yeah, you, you missed it. With the help of this app. With the help of, of this app, that is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, so speaking of the app, let's actually get into it. Uh, so the main component of this app will be the visualization. So the successful implementation of floating solar in co-hosts means that this project can be emulated elsewhere in similar communities. So I assume that we're all familiar with the capital region and uh, the city of co-hosts uh, can be used based on its economic status as a testing ground for other uh, communities in the same economic status you follow. Uh, so other communities that want to follow the path of co-hosts and use this app to visualize uh, appropriate or suitable water reservoirs to implement floating solar on. 
So that's what's entailed under the visualization component here. So first, this, uh, this web app will include reservoirs. And on top of that, it also, uh, it also brings in the uh, low moderate income data of congressional districts that are divided into census tracts. Uh, and then lastly, as a, as a final component, or like one of our final goals for this website was to integrate the electric substation from uh, a branch of Homeland Security into uh, the visualization. So Dr. Erickson was actually the person that suggested this uh, this part of the project. So maybe Dr. Erickson, you can elaborate. Sure. On this. The, so the 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 um. Producing and generating power kind of has two parts. One is obviously the solar collectors that are flowing uh, on the reservoir, but you've got to get the power into the grid. Okay, so and and so that part of that the question of the the economics of doing the floating solar is what is the proximity of your generating capacity to a, a substation, convenient substation, um, so that which is the entry point for the power into the grid. And in the case of Cohos, and, and, and maybe Michael, when he's demoing, can, can kind of illustrate this. Where the, the reservoir is with the floating solar to, to be installed is actually quite conveniently located. And that was kind of a driver for them. And, and what, what ha adding this extra dimension does is when, when a community is evaluating this, they can also kind of see for reference the proximity. Exactly. Um, yeah. So. Now that we've touched upon the visualization part, yes. Sorry, what's the uh, platform of this app? Is it a website or an app? Yeah, it's a website. Okay. Okay. Using R Shiny. I see. I'll, I'll show it to you. Oh, it's a web app. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. I'll show it to you like right after okay. uh, this yeah. introduction. Uh, and the second part under so on the website, uh, just a heads up, you'll see a map that in that compo that's composed of all the visualization aspects I just talked about. And below the map, you'll see statistics regarding the reservoirs. Uh, of the currently selected state. So it provides um, graphical as well as numerical representation of the data. Um, so without further ado, let's actually jump into the website. So yeah, this is the uh, main page of the website. So as you can see, by default, we've selected New York and District 20, which is the district that Cohost is located in. And on this map, as you can see, uh, the, entire, the entire District 20 is highlighted. Uh, the dots represent reservoirs, and the color rep the colors represent the ownership type of the reservoir. So, for example, blue dots, if you map to the legend over here, represent private reservoirs, and orange dots represent uh, low uh, reservoirs that are owned by local governments. And uh, yeah, you can zoom in and out. Uh, and then, the, um, since the Congressional District 20 is, as you can see here, is divided into uh, smaller census tracts, and uh, the coloring of the census tracts maps to the percentage of low or moderate income within that census tract is actually the average of the uh, census blocks within a census tract. Um, I'll talk about the data aspect of this later, but for now, just keep that in mind. And then the electric substation that we just talked about uh, so now the default is that we selected a radius 10 from the center of Congressional District 20. So uh, now we plot all the electric substations within a 10 mile radius from the center of the Congressional District. And then if you click on a reservoir, you can see its name, its intended purpose, ownership type, and of course the low moderate income percentage uh, of its surroundings, because the main purpose of the website is for governments to check, okay, is this uh, reservoir like suitable for implementing clean solar, um, so that you know it can get the associated economic benefits with respect to the community that is located in. And here, um, can you zoom in on the uh, yeah. co-host? Co-host? Yeah. Yeah. So co-host would be somewhere. Yeah. Here, somewhere here, right? Lovely. Yeah, you're, you're almost north of the Sorry, where is the Mohawk? There it is. Yep. Right now. Mohawk. Yeah, this is so this actually is uh so zoom in a little bit more, but yeah, there's a there's a reservoir that they're actually doing the project on. 
and uh, the 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 nearest. I actually I don't know which of the two substations. It might be this substation that they actually are routing to. Um, so if I click on substation, also displays. I think I, I think it's the Johnson Road substation. Although this one is this physically one? this one is physically a little bit closer. But I, I can't remember. It's one of these two substations. They're actually jacking into. Right. Um, yeah, but the point is, uh, the map combines the geo, like the geo data of reservoirs, uh, with the low moderate income uh, data of a con of a congressional district. And then, if you scroll down, since we currently selected New York, uh, we have the graphical as well as the numerical representation of the data. So, first, these two uh, stacked bar plots on top. Uh, so, if you want to see, okay, of the Reservoirs that are owned by local government, how many of them were roughly like what percentage of them are intended for water supply? You can just map to the primary purpose here and find out that the vast majority of them is intended for water supply. And the bar plot on the right is just an inverse of the uh, plot on the left. So, for example, if you want to figure out, okay, of all the reservoirs that are intended for water supply, you know, how many, like, how many of them are owned by local governments and how many of them are privately owned? So you can just see uh, this bar on the left and you can just map to the legend. Down below, we have this table that basically provides a numerical summary of the two bar plots on the top combined. And then here we have um, two bar plots that, shows, that show the distribution of low moderate income levels across Reservoir owner types on the left and private purposes on the right. So also just very straightforward uh, for local local government, like the person that helps you analyze. Uh, you know, for example, if you want to see uh, all of the privately owned reservoirs in New York, you know how many are lo located in um, congressional districts or census tracts. Uh, they're of like twenty to forty percent low moderate income level, or uh, forty to sixty percent. All right, it's just the same thing, but based on primary purpose. And these two tables below, basically this one is a numerical representation of this chart, and this one is a numerical representation of this unit. And kind of the, the motivation for having all this information on the page is to kind of create a tear sheet for um, whoever is studying it. You know, they to really do a kind of a complete uh, a complete summary on a single sheet. And this is probably based on how we knew the app was being used. I mean, uh, uh, people from Cohos in, the, in the, the office, the city office in Cohos, were demonstrating this to, to Representative Tonko's staff and to Representative Tonko um, a number of times. And this is the sort of thing that was of interest to them. So this is kind of uh, the member of Congress was our our data tester. Uh, so it's just the numerical data that can further uh, support the argument that exactly. the local that's, governments want to make. That's exactly right. And it's kind of tuned to sort of the, the questions that are being asked and kind of the, the decisions that are being made regarding the, the grant. It's like this, they're making the argument that it's going to benefit low to moderate income communities in the following ways. And this is illustrating that 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 time. So, yeah. Uh, and then if we hop over to this middle tab right here, since actually I'll hop back to here for now. Since on this map, it's impractical. It will take an incredibly long time to plot all the reservoirs in all states of the U.S. Here we just have a broad overview of all the reservoirs uh, that are located in the U.S. with their colors. Uh, denoted by the ownership type, and it just provides a basic geographical like overview um, of the suitable water reservoirs for floating solar. Uh, so, how do you tell which ones are suitable again? So, it's the ones which are used for water supply, or oh, so it's very arbitrary. So, it's up to local governments to look at the data, look at the surroundings, you know, like uh, look at the type. Of reservoir and the photovoltaic production associated with it, as well as uh, the economic status of its yeah. so, surrounding, and make a judgment. Yeah, I, 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 so the reservoir data is was compiled by the, the National Renewable Energy Lab in Rome. Yeah, in Rome, and they 
Um, so suitability kind of is a uh, is a judgment call. It really is tied into what the intended use is. So they they basically did a rating, a kind of a rating. They they did compiled metadata on almost every uh, every reservoir. It's it's really amazing when you really get down to the into the the, the deep the, the the number of reservoirs um, and the data that they have on it. And some some is a, a approximate that sometimes the the coordinates aren't quite right, but it, it provides a, a convenient uh, data set that you then combine with your other data. And so it ultimately is a decision of the, as Michael said, of, of the community. You know, this is this is the information we have mm -hmm. for these known reservoirs. Um, and suitability might be based on ownership. Okay. Um, suitability might be based on other it's, it's, Yeah, it's it's location too. Yeah, is is it studio might be based on the, the the size of the body of water? Is it big enough to be of use? Is it well? It actually, there's a every reservoir has a bunch of click on. Every reservoir has an estimated uh, capacity photovoltaic production. Okay, so there's if used to the maximum that Enrel has rated it for could produce this many megawatts or kilowatts, whatever the case may be. So basically, it's impossible without this website for local government to examine like all the available water reservoirs at this level. But with the vis visualization provided by this website, they can look at all the data and you know, be it geographical or economic, and you know, compile all the data together and make the best judgments depending yeah. on the cost and benefits associated okay. with implementing a building solar on the suit. On According to Enrel, this is the first time that this data has been combined in this way. Wow. Yeah. yeah, very neat. Very yeah, good. and then they were a little bit apologetic because it was the first time that it was really anchored to maps with people looking at it, and as the British say, in anger, you know, kind of really looking at it and saying, "That's not quite where that reservoir is." <laughs> but uh, so it's yeah, yeah. Uh, no question on suitability because it's kind of a judgmental yeah, word. Yeah, it's not. At first, I was also very confused about the whole like suitable wording. I was like, you know, all the water reservoirs are available. But that's the name of the data set. So, um, so yeah. So back to the third tab and last tab. Uh, we just have background information on this project. If you're free, just feel free to read it afterwards. I'll be more than happy to show. And then yet another picture of people working on this floating solar project. Uh, yeah. That's an interesting photo because um, that is actually, uh, except for what you see in the background, is kind of similar to the layout of the photos. Okay. Yeah. So they just blanket like the whole. Well, it depends on what the capacity is, but uh, in essence, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so part of the suitability question is what is the actual purpose of the reservoir, uh, and. It won't be any, um, One second. Actually, let me just check if my mic is on. Th these mics are on. Don't worry, Michael. You're being recorded. But I'm muted on my web. So I'm being muted. It doesn't matter about you. It, well, it might. I think just fine. You sound good. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just because I saw Don't Dr. Him. Bennett's like photo on here, so I just wanted to check yeah. to see yeah. if she can see it. Yeah. Um. So, so yeah, so you can see right there that in the data set, there's over 24,000 um, uh, reservoirs in the data set from across the country. Right. Uh, here is just a quote from Representative uh, Paul Tonko. And then here we just cite the data sources that we use for the floating solar explorer. So we actually combined a lot of data set that came from many different sources. And yeah, at first it's kind of hard to merge all of them. I'll explain all of those later. but. Uh, yeah, and just some further citations down below. And if you a week, let's say a week from today, if you don't remember anything from today's presentation, uh, what I hope that you remember is that this project is about using data analytics to drive changes in public policy because this website provides, you know, a fundamental like a backbone, if you will, for local for local governments uh, to make the best judgments uh, in terms of local policy. So without further ado, uh, I'll break down the app. So the app is composed of three components. Uh, the first one being the data itself. 
The second one is called the data set generator. Basically, in the raw data that's given to us, we need to transform those raw data into organized and, um, and usable data that can be readily imported into the app itself. So, just draw this on the board here. So, we have the raw data. So, all of these are initially stored in a folder called general. And that falls under the greater data folder. And then here we have data set generator. I'll just call it B underscore G. It's an R file that takes in the raw data systematically and transforms those into uh, organized data. I'll fill the gap, fill in the gap later. And then we have app.r. This is an R shiny file that's basically responsible for creating the website that we saw just now based on the produced data. So yeah. So in terms of the raw data, it's broken down into four components. The first one is the low modern income. Uh, that basically maps to the maps to the shading you see. Uh, so recall that for District 20, um, the greater congressional districts divide into census tracts, and this is the data that's responsible for the shading of the census tracts. With the shading, as I said before, based on the average of census blocks within the census tract. And then in addition, we have the congressional district outlines. So I'll hop over to the website. So if you look closely to the congressional district, you see this green border uh, surrounding the congressional district. And that's what I mean by the congressional district outline. The third component of the transform data is the reservoirs. Uh, obviously, the reservoirs that we just got from InReal don't have the associated uh, low moderate income data or the special coordinates and uh, data set generator uh, takes into account that and augments the, re the, the initial reservoir data with spatial coordinates that map to that can be uh, mapped here and then also combines the low mod in low moderate income uh, associated with that reservoir. And lastly, we have the electric substation data. Um, so this data we just downloaded directly from uh, this branch of Homeland Security, and we just took out like irrelevant columns, and it's pretty straightforward to map. It actually came with coordinates and all that, all that, so we didn't have to do uh, any busy work. Kind of ironic. Yeah, security supply <laughs> locations. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, and I just want to elaborate on uh, the components that uh, contribute to each of the transform data. Uh, I won't show you the R code. I thought about that, but I want to make this as accessible to beginners as possible. So looking at the R code right now, it's just going to be a mess, and no one's going to remember a thing. But the main components that contribute to each of these. So for low moderate income data, uh, initially we have the national low moderate income data from the US census, and then we merge that to census tracts uh, to a data set that has the census tracts to congressional district, like the mapping by an identifier called GeoID. And lastly, we integrate that uh, with the Tigris shape. So Tigris is a package in R that contains the geometric shapes of uh, the associated GeoID and if we, if we merge all three of them together, we have the economic data plus uh, the geographic, like the numerical identifier, and we have the geometric shape to actually be used on the map itself. And then secondly, in terms of the congressional district outline, uh, we have, it's actually pretty straight, straightforward. We actually got the congressional district numbers from the U.S. election data uh, from a package called FCC 12 on, in R. And we just, it's very straightforward, just run, run, run. And up until we get all those numbers from the elections. And then we merge that with congressional district shape file. And that's how we get the green outline. Yeah. So you said uh, FTC 12. So would that be the 2012? Like, F because I'm wondering, because they just redraw. Commission. Yeah. 12. 12. So if they just redrew, like the election maps, like I know in New York got totally redrawn. Uh, 
that, all that stuff is not finalized yet. Yeah, that's, it's, that's like a black cloud that's moving over everything. Uh, yeah, yeah. But John, that that is a new congressional district. It's on the map. I mean, it has to be the Well, it's, yeah, it's, it's not the it looks, new one. It yeah, looks, I think it's like the new one, but it's not the it's new not, one. It's not exactly. Yeah. yeah. Actually, it's impossible for us to make, to use the most up to date because the census track data that we got from one of these, I, I forgot which one it was because this project's like two months ago, but one of these given to us, like the data was from 2015. So if we integrate data that's from, let's say, 2020, there's inconsistencies in the GOID. So they changed up like some of the census blocks. And as a result of the merge, there could be like errors, there could be like no values that are caused by the merging process. So as a compromise. That, that could be. There, there were. <laughs> there were. We spent, we spent two weeks. We spent two weeks trying to like, because we, we got the newest data from one of those. And we merged with and we merged with another data file that's from 2015. And for two weeks, I was struggling to find out, okay, why? Or is there like no, like for some of the low moderate income, I got like zero or like negative. And then I was trying so hard to find out the cost and that was the cost. If he could have woken me up in the middle of the night to tell me he figured it out, he would have. <laughs> yeah. So that's just, unfortunately. Uh, Two weeks of Michael's life lost. <laughs> unfortunately, a very uh, sad uh, compromise that we have to make. But it snapped together once you figured it out. Yeah. And, and it, but it's it's a it's an important lesson, um, and and a, kind of the, the ultimate answer to this question. You have to make sure they all, you know, are lining up. You know, those census track. You have to have the right census track data set, the right congressional district data. Set, they all have to line up. It's, it's all about data cleaning, isn't it? Well, exactly. Data alignment. It's more alignment than anything. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then going to uh, going on to reservoirs, uh, as I said before, it's just very pretty straightforward using certain R functions mm -hmm. to uh, get the reservoirs to have their uh, plottable latitude and longitude on the map, and also augment that with the national low moderate income data, so that when you click on the reservoir dots, it shows uh, the low moderate income that that reservoir is located in. And then lastly, for electric substations. Thank you for Homeland Security. Like they did a wonderful job of compiling that data beforehand. All we had to do was remove columns that we didn't need for the purpose of the website, and it's very straightforward to plot. But it, yeah, are you going to talk about performance issues though? Yeah, yeah later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, yeah, it's just a flowchart of like basically what I drew on the board. Uh, and I just want to mention here that of the newly created data, uh, each. Data folder, so all of these subfolders are stored in the general data folder. Uh, all of these folders are named and organized in the same way for the convenience uh, sake that I'll be talking about later. Um, so yeah, newly transformed data grouped by individual states. So every each each of these subfolders contain 50 files from Alaska to Wyoming, and they're all named the same. So that in the app, when we call on functions to get the data set, we can make the name of the data a parameter to pass in, and that really that makes it that makes the app.r file like much easier to uh, yeah to uh, do stuff. So yeah, so now that we've talked, we now that we've touched upon the data part, I'll get into app.r and uh, talk about some milestones that we achieved. So like some major functionalities that we achieved uh, during the de development stage of this app and. With those functionalities, hopefully provide very brief intro to our shining. So, uh, first, I just want to break down the structure of app.r. So, just erase this right now. So, basically, the first components libraries, so just like very straightforward, like import statements, just as you will with any app or any code, like you import packages. Same idea, import the packages that we use in the app. And then let's skip prep work for now, but hop right over to UI and server. So for our Shiny apps, there's actually two ways that you can create an app. So you can either have the UI and server separately as UI.R and server.R, or you can combine them in one called app.R. Uh, since our web, the code for our website is only, I think, like seven to eight hundred lines long, uh, we just combine the two components in one. But if you're making a more 
uh, convoluted website, uh, I think for organizational purposes, in some cases would be better if you split those two components into two different files. Uh, so what is UI? So everything in UI, well, actually you can just perceive UI and server as the front end and back end of any web app respect, like respect, respectively. Uh, and the UI is basically the front end. So everything in UI is included in uh, this function called fluid page. So in the fluid page, uh, I assume that we're all familiar with HTML. So uh, if you have like, you know, the lines of HTML that make up for a website, same thing here, but just in our code, you can have, uh, you know, have like title bar. So for example, if you go to the website, we have, you know, like a title bar, uh, that does this, and then we have a sidebar that, you know, allows users to input selections. So that's what the UI does. So it just provides a layout to the website and embedded in the layout, we have uh, reactive inputs and outputs. Uh, so inputs are basically what's being inputted by the user as the user interacts with the website. So for example, if I want to change the state from New York to New Hampshire, that's getting an input. Right and the system. So here you embed something like select input or whatever function, uh, and then as an output, let's say uh, you have a line of you have a line that wants you to say like, oh, so if you want to say like statistics, state statistics of the currently selected state, that currently selected state will be an output. So uh, in that case, the output will be whatever the user input it here. And so speaking of the input and output components, that's exactly what a server does. So the server, everything in the server, everything is uh, in this function called server and then input, output, and then session. So obviously session is our like our session of the R Shine website. And then inputs and outputs are just like a generalization of the of the inputs and outputs we embedded in the layout under food page, but just like generalized parameter that we pass into server so that in the server, we can have reactive variables, calculations, or functions that provide the input, I mean, provide the output based on the input it gathered from the user. Yeah, any questions? Oh yeah, and then forgot about prep work. So in the server, a lot of the functions or calculations can be pretty long or they tend to be, uh, they tend to be pretty hard to organize um, or like, or uh, it can be hard to organize or just like, or just organize neat, neatly on the code itself. So as a result, you have the prep for in between the libraries and the, so it's library and the UI and the server. So this line zero and this line 800, let's say, and in between, uh, I personally like to keep things organized and short in under the server. So that's why I moved a lot of the reactive like calculations and functions into this area that I call prep work in between library and the UI. I think, so I think I, I, I know what kind of the words here you're wrestling with. The, what, what Michael's trying to get at is, so in, Virtually all of the tutorials, the shiny tutorials you'll see, um, the demonstrations of reactive of reactivity will be uh, pretty simplistic. Okay, they're in the UI section. They'll have some input widgets that you wiggle. You'll change some inputs, change some settings. There's an output widget that's being that's like a plot, say that's being changed by your input, and then the logic that's in the server. Part will be very, very simple. It'll be uh, your, it'll be the, the plot output will be dependent upon like your input settings. Okay. Uh, in reality, in an application like this, what's happening with the data and the, the reactive changes to data is much more complicated. And so uh, sometimes your data, uh, the state of your, uh, of a data frame might be dependent upon some conditions apply to multiple different inputs, different or and or changes to other data. And so in in this app, there's a, this section where it's it's purely about uh, changing the state of the data. 
itself. And then uh, your, your various outputs and plots uh, are, are, are defined based on that change data, the conditions on that data. Okay, so it's, it's and, and this is, it, it takes, uh, there's, there's some subtlety involved in kind of thinking through uh, and, and having the right conditions because you, it's, it's not just about, it's not like a normal anal analysis where it's, it's about whatever the data is. You have to think about uh, the, 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 the changes that are happening to the data, whether certain changes should be applied in certain, certain so like, there's kind of like a time dimension. It's in a very event driven thing and there's a time dimension. Right. Uh, so yeah, basically the purpose of creating this like web work section is just, just to simplify some of the uh, Oh, that can be very, very long server. So, yeah, for the sake of better work, this is a nice way of laying it out. Would you Thank agree? You. <laughs> yeah, so let's actually get, in, get into the first key functionality that we implemented for this project, which is uh, a refined organization methodology for data sets. So, as I just discussed when I was talking about the data, the newly transformed data uh, are being stored in four different subfolders with all those subfolders organized in the same way in that each one of those encompass uh, 50 states from Alaska to Wyoming. And the name of those separate data for states can be used as a parameter in our reactive function under server. So if I get into the code, you can see that in the prep work section, we have this function called get data set. So it's just function of selected state and which type. So, for example, if you want to get the low mod data for New York, we just pass in get data set, New York, and then uh, low mod. And, or if we want to get the data set from Massachusetts for uh, congressional district outline, we just pass in get data set, Massachusetts, and then CD here. So, uh, yeah, so, but the gist of that is just to, uh, if you organize the data smartly, your app can be a lot cleaner with the organized naming convention. And I would just pop into where this function actually get called. So yeah, if you want to make, uh, so for example, right now we have New York and we want to get uh, all the districts that are in New York. So there's 27 congressional districts in New York. All we you can, do- You can actually change things. You gotta, yeah, yeah, the entire time you've been demoing the yeah. app, you haven't changed anything. I'll change, change it. I'll change it later. Okay. I'll change it later. <laughs> but let's say for now, if you want to, like, for the drop down menu, we want to get 27 congress congressional districts for New York. What we do in the code is we pass in. So for the choices, the choices for here, you just get the data. That's how we, like, this is one of the, lo the location, one of the locations that we use the function get data set has in New York and low mod, and we manipulate like the columns and all that so that we get 27 districts out of it. So yeah, that's key functionality one, which is use your naming conventions for data sets correctly. I mean, efficiently and not just for the app, but in your like future, like in any project, keeping an organized way to uh, store your data and use, you know, whatever, like, naming conventions uh, that can make the entire project more convenient be a very smart choice to make. And then the key functionality number two is just the statistical outputs for the currently selected state. So, for example, for New York right now, we have all of these. Uh, so, in the server, the plots will be created by this function called uh, render render plot. So these plots, so if you use render plot function uh, and you pass in like the current uh, reactive like reservoir data or something, and that's how it maps to the data here. And same with the tables. The tables, we actually use an external package called DT. So in the, in the server, uh, that's created by render data table. So same idea uh, as the render plot function, you just pass in the, the data that you have right now for the currently chosen state, and it creates, you know, this table for you. 
Um, and then reactively, if you change to need Emsure, now what the app does is that it re-guess the data sets for New Hampshire using the name using the naming function. So the user input will be New Hampshire. And in the get data set function, we pass in New Hampshire as a parameter and guess all the associated with data sets with it. And then reactively, like correspondingly, uh, these plots get changed. And your number of districts change. Yeah, and your number of districts change. So yeah. The statistical outputs for the currently selected state. And the third and arguably arguably the longest or the milestone that took us the longest time to achieve was upgrading the congressional districts upon changing state selection. So what I mean by that is if you choose the state New Hampshire, select and this changes correspondingly correspondingly, and so is the map here. So can, as you can see, this is no longer New York, New York District 20, but we're not gerrymandered, are we? Currently, we are in New Hampshire 1. We changed to New Jersey. You can see that changes in New Jersey District 1. So why is this simple function the most challenging milestone for us to complete in the project? Because you can have problems such as the number, the different number of congressional districts for each state. So, for example, in New York, you have 27 districts, but in Jersey, you only have 12. And in states like Delaware or, uh, or Alaska or Vermont, you have this one single congressional district called at large. And although, although, like, although the changes in the number of congressional districts, uh, it's a very small change, uh, that's a lot of work to do. Uh, for the app, could, could you go back just for, for just for entertainment value? I it would just show. Can you go to like Delaware? I'm yeah. gonna, I'm gonna that. Go to Delaware. I'm gonna show off the circuit. And where where is it that we see the at large? And then this is the entire. I, no, I, I, I want to see it. I maybe it's Pennsylvania. I want to see that that issue that we. That freaked us out, you know, the this thing up here. Oh yeah, so Delaware, the I learned geography. Yeah, so the, the at large congressional district of Delaware, which is basically Delaware, the entire state, is actually like it's actually this semi semicircle. And that is for real. Yeah, I mean, we we that showed up, and we're looking at that going, no freaking way. You know, we, there must be some kind of bug. This is crazy. Well, the state, the state. Up, that's exactly it's that's how it's defined. This is exactly how it's defined. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like Pac-Man. What's that? Looks like Pac-Man. It's the head of Pac-Man. Yeah. And you can you if you go to like Wikipedia or whatever and you look up there's these ancient documents that actually have that circle. Wow. So we just drew with a compass, huh? Yeah. Yeah. But uh, as you can see, a very simple function, but the most challenging task for us to complete during the project, because one, you like, so each of these selections, so the selection of Delaware and the selection of at large were whatever district, like 5, 10, like 17, all of those are being recorded as user inputs back in the server or back in the UI. And if you change Delaware to Connecticut, in Connecticut, you don't, in the Connecticut, uh, Congressional district file. You don't have this. So you don't have this uh, district selection called at large. Instead, it goes back to numerical, like one to five. And in our in in the app itself, you have to account for that separately. And vice versa. If and the other uh, the other aspect is just mapping the user input to the actual map. So the map is actually plotted by this package called Leaflet. And the inf and in the leaflet, every time you have to get a, like the correct data set for everything in order to make this plot like actually work. So if you just make one change in district, it could mess up the entirety of this website because um, you know if you select if you change to Delaware and your and your district selection remains one or right now if you're on three, it remains on three. This map becomes null because uh, there is in District 3 where District 1 in Delaware is the district at large in Delaware. 
So that's why this simple task took us the longest to complete because we, in the code itself, I won't go into the details. Uh, you have to account for all the variations. Uh, for example, going from Connecticut to Hawaii, like from a commercial district that would be existent in Connecticut into a non-existent district in Kauai. So, for example, uh, hypothetically, let's say you have five districts in Connecticut right, right now and you select number five. When you, when you switch back to Hawaii, let's say, for argument's sake, Hawaii only had three districts, uh, you have to set a default selection when you change it to Hawaii. And in here, the default uh, upon changing state is one. And if the state only has one district, the selection of district would change to at large. Um, and then the other thing that I want to touch upon is, uh, I think, right. The other thing I want to talk, talk about is the performance issue. So it's very, this, so this is a bit specific to leaflet package, which is the package that allows us to plot this map here. Uh, so this map actually composes of different layers of data. So we have, just to zoom out, we have the base map, which is the US or like the world if you scroll to the right or left enough, or like far enough. And then uh, there's layer, this layer is obviously this low moderate income uh, data for census tracts on top. Uh, you have the reservoirs and then you also have electric substations. And every time we would change the district, we don't want to plot everything like we don't want to plot like everything. So, for example, if we change from five to four, we don't want to repeatedly plot like the green border that uh, you can see here for Connecticut because we're still in Connecticut. Nor do we want to replot all the reservoirs because all the reservoirs are still in Connecticut. All we want to replot is the census tract shading and also the electric substation and associated radius circle. Uh, so in leaflet, uh, at first, uh, we didn't we didn't take that into account, and as a result, upon changing uh, congressional districts, uh, those changes can take the website a long time uh, to uh, to display. But after uh, I discovered this function called uh, leaf proxy, you can actually select the individual data that you want to replot while keeping others the same. So that's one small tweak that we made towards the end of the project to make the website uh, run a lot faster than it did before. I knew about it. I just wanted you to find it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and also just as I demonstrated the website just now, a very subtle and by new thing that, that you may not have uh, realized is that every time, let's say we change from connect to district five into like, let's say we just go to, uh, go back to New York. This is the analytics part, Kristen. Yeah, so in New York defaults to 20 because we made that default co-host. You can see that uh, Connecticut District 5 is definitely a smaller congressional district than New York District 20, but the zoom level accommodates for that change. So, for example, uh, I went to school near New York City, and I know for a fact that New York 11, yeah, that will be Staten Island is a, even a smaller district than New York District 20. And as you can see, the map adjusts for that zoom level correspondingly. And although, again, this is a very small change, it actually took us, uh, we actually had to use linear regression uh, to, make this, to make this happen, which is dynamic adjustment of zoom levels upon changing congressional districts. So what we did was we just picked a lot of like cases for con congressional districts. I think we picked like 20 of them. So. Uh, Montana is only one, and Monta Montana is huge. Uh, so for Montana, uh, the latitude, the longitude, those are the x input, and then for y input, we manually uh, we manually find uh, a comfortable zoom level for uh, to display data. So for example, call that zoom level two, and then record that in the model, and then go back to New York District Eleven, uh, find the latitude and longitude, find the distance in between. And then find a zoom, let's say call this seven because it's more zoomed in. Record that in the model, repeat this process for 20 different state selection, I mean district selections. And then every time we change the district, we actually have to uh, we actually have to put the latitude on 
new difference in latitude and longitude uh, of the district into the model, and the model returns to us a new zoom level for the selection. That was clever of you. <laughs> Say that again. Review from IDM. I thought that was clever of you. Actually, uh, uh, Dr. Erickson came up with the linear regression idea. I tried to find some like weird like mod like formulas that uh that like uh play that manipulate the latitude and longitude coordinates with like sine pi and like cosine tangents, but none of those worked. And I'm not a mathy enough person to figure out the exact formula. And we just you know so I pulled out my we my we just like take <laughs> start doing the work. So yeah, I'm just I'm just too lazy to figure out the actual formula, but I'm sure there's a formula that accommodates for that type of change. But what are the other inputs into the model? So is it just latitude and longitude, and it's able to determine? I mean, when you so the difference in latitude and difference in longitude, and figure out the figure like the height and width, basically. Yeah, basically height and width. Okay, yeah. okay, that makes yeah. more sense. It's, yeah. yeah, it's it's kind of it's one of those things where you. I think somehow the package would have it, but it, it's just but kind the, of a, it's, 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 I guess it's kind of dependent upon what the yeah. app, actual application of it, but essentially you, you know, for every time you center the map, you, you need to specify uh, what the, what the zoom should be. And so how do you figure out the zoom? Well, let's base sure. it on the, the size of congressional district. How do you do that? John, what if we use UTM coordinates as a go between? Because that's nice to Cartesian. So you just go from that long to UTM, figure out what you want to figure out, and then go back to the flat long. Oh, I, said, I mean, we sort of. Flat long is not bad. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying, you know, if you go into UTM, it's a nice Cartesian grid. And we know the equation behind it. Too, but it's, 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 well, we should have called you up top. <laughs> you work with one IT But uh, yeah, if we actually had time to document like maybe 20 different other like data inputs into the model, for some of the districts, the zoom level is uh, still not perfect because partly because. But it's pretty good. If you go to Montana, yeah. go to the Montana. I mean, you know, Montana is huge. And what it's going to do, if you stayed at the. Yeah, so as you can see, it just zooms out to. I thought it. Yeah. So the zoom levels here. The the thing that I wanted to say was that for leaflet, like the zoom level, it only takes in integers. So as opposed to like you know Google or Apple Maps, you have the sliding gradient. Like as you zoom in on the map, it just scrolls like smoothly. Here, uh, this is not the lag in the website. It's just like, you know, like one level, two levels. It only takes an integer as a zoom level, and I think that partly caused. Uh, the imperfection in the linear regression model, because right. if this was on a decimal scale, the model would be much better. But uh, right now it just rounds to the nearest like integer. Do you have anything to add? No, no. Okay. Uh, yeah, we are, we're rapidly coming up at seven o'clock here, so. Yeah, and this is also going to be my last function. All right, awesome. yeah. So last key functionality is the electric substation and radius range selection. So, uh, I'll over to here. As you can see in Montana, uh, there is, you can see on the data, there's 2,500 uh, potentially suitable water reservoirs. And that's just for the water reservoirs. Uh, for, um, for the electric the number of the electric substations, oh, and also recall in New York, there are only 500 of them. And in New Hampshire, I think there weren't even 100 of them. But in every state, there could be thousands of electric substations. So what do you do, what do we do to accommodate for that? Because if we want to plot like all the electric substations in the given state, this this website is just going to crash instantly because we can't plot like two thousand reservoirs and like four thousand other electric substations. And this is the rationale for creating this radius uh, selection right here is that we only plot. Uh, the selected reservoirs within a given radius, um, and how we did how we determine the center of the circle or the start of the radius is that we uh, look at all the geographical coordinates of the currently selected congressional district, and we take the median, we take the mean uh, center latitude and longitude, and based on the center latitude and longitude, we plot uh, we plot the substations 
going out from that center into the selected radius. And the gist of that is just for you to consider if you have like uh, websites or things where you want to incorporate a lot of data, uh, but uh, the large amount of data that you're trying to plot also hinders performance. Sometimes you want to come to compromise between performance and the amount of data you want to visualize. Of course, our website is not perfect in that, uh, as you can see, for larger states some, like Montana, even if we choose like 100 mile radius, like this is not big enough to accommodate for all this for the entirety of the state. Uh, and also, it doesn't account for the density of the reservoirs. So, for, for example, here, although this is the geographical, like the data wise center latitude and longitude of the at large district in Montana, the majority of the reservoirs are further on the right. Uh, and just doing this simple, like, Centering and then expanding the radius doesn't accommodate for those density or uh, like size issues that would fit in for all the states and congressional districts. And because that was near the end of the project, we didn't have time to accommodate for that. Uh, but uh, if if you know like we take if we want to do like a next step for this website, uh, ideally we can uh, in the server we make the center of the radius somehow adjustable. And we will also make it work with, um, you know, having to deal with the density of the reservoirs. And that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, if you want to work on your own project, um, you know, you have to come, you have to come to a balance between performance and a large amount of data that hinders performance. Yeah. So, yeah, that concludes my presentation. Well, thank you. Let's, uh, you know, that. This has been a really interesting project because you have to kind of balance uh, usability was always a concern. Uh, you know, from the very start, our user was first the uh, city of Cohoes, you know, the people in the project's office, city of Cohoes, and then, my God, you know, the congressional staff, right? And, and so, wanting to get something which basically was was presenting the message like from the start that it was like had a minimal viable product basically had to be New York State 20th district immediately and then kind of grow it from there and uh, and, and factor in all these things and, and uh, with a, the long range goal you know the, the, the stretch goal first of just getting states you know get all the states the first step was actually re reorganizing the data and like yeah, yeah, commenting yeah. all the code. Fixing John's bad part, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then, uh, yeah, as I said, the key functionality three, which is uh, reactively changing the selected congressional district on changing state, um, that took us a long time. Because yeah. every other function depends on the user inputs to make, for example, the leaf map. If you have a no selection, that messes up the entire map. What a subtle thing. Oh, but, so you know, surprisingly, you know, that it's surprisingly challenging to figure out its stable behavior from how many districts does a particular how to get that. Yeah. All right. Any qu other questions for Mike? Or just any general questions for me as an undergrad? <laughs> Yeah, I have a question. Um, so not uh, technical, but the website, but uh, rather about the floating panels. Um, yeah, yeah. So playing the devil's advocate, uh, what are the risks of them? Because I imagine, like, if you put all of them about reservoirs, so reservoirs are not just re water reservoirs. You can't swim in them. There is, um, there are fishes. Usually, there is a floor and fauna attached to it. Now, if you put floating panels on top of that, you reduce the uh, sunlight, right? That is, that is uh, shining to them, and of course, that uh, that has severe effects on, for example, all of the ecosystem. Oh, ecosystem, yeah. right? So, what what's the drawback to it? So, yeah, can I answer? Yeah, that? of course. Yeah. So, Sasha, uh, reservoirs have different purposes, right? Okay, and this is one of the reasons why the um, you know why. Uh, in addition to the purpose of, you know, in addition to ownership, there, there's the ownership question, there's a purpose question. Yeah. Um, and only uh, a certain percentage of, so none of the reservoirs uh, have all of the concerns that you specified. Not all, like, for example, the, the, the reservoir of Cohoes, which is a, a city-owned reservoir, 
its sole purpose. I'm not even sure what its ultimate purpose is, but it's it's not for you know many of the things. It's 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 not for um, you know aquaculture in the terms of of. Well, if it's for if it's for water supply, sometimes they just fence them in like the. Well, that's right. Here. So is there, is there are actually situations where in in certain certain many circumstances having this sort of protection and cover is actually a beneficial thing, mm -hmm. a beneficial thing. So my, yeah, was, you know, my, my, uh, my first reaction was, was exactly the same. It's like, you're putting this, you're, you're covering a reservoir. What's the impact of covering this reservoir? And that gets to kind of Jade's question. It's, it's a suitability thing. Okay. If it's, it, it, it's whether or not a person, our particular, like, consider the Tomahawk uh, Reservoir, uh, east, uh, yeah, east of here, <laughs> um, uh, on the way to Vermont. It might be solely inappropriate to to put a, a, a photovoltaic setup on that because that's a nature preserve as well. Okay, um, so it's a, it's a different purpose, and and so each. Potential each reservoir needs to be considered in that in that right. yeah, right. so, and, and it's not um it's not part of the that would be an interesting component of the data, but it's not part of the ML data. And it's actually kind of curious that it's not. Maybe it's implicit in the, the purposes that they have the fund. Yeah, because I, I, I went around with my children to, uh, to some errands and I seen different water reservoirs. They looked like a lake. And you had eagles and everybody throwing around. So even if the reservoir itself like was used as a reservoir, but a lot of nature surrounding it uh, was drawing from it, right? But there are also water reservoirs that look like a tank and exactly. Yeah. So that and that's exactly what the, the Coho's reservoir looks like. Mm -hmm. it, it's like it's a big rectangle. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big rectangle, um, and that serves some purpose. You know, it's nicely well maintained. But but it's it's yeah. it's literally it's like a poster child for putting a photo uh, municipal floating photo voltaic. Like, <laughs> here's a big square of water in town, <laughs> substation next to it. What's the solar on top? And, but there's many like that. Okay, mm -hmm. there's many like that. Um, but again, you know, lots of different purposes. You know, there's other reservoirs that are parts of that are that are part of the NREL survey that are. That are documented, but are uns unsuitable for other reasons. Like there's some, you know, um, many reservoirs that are behind dams on rivers. You know, that may or not be uh, suitable for other reasons, for engineering reasons. So what's the suitability of Lake Mead? <laughs> it's, it's decreasing. <laughs> Less than it was when you asked the question. Well, you go all those buckets, yeah. No, I just want to like in answer to your question, like where are some drawbacks? Like obviously, like when I just got introduced to the project, the first like drawback I consider was like the political uh, implications of implementing locally owned like renewable solar panels because mm -hmm. on one hand it saves like utility cost and using that cost you can you know, reinvest those costs in beneficial uh, aspects of, for the community but on the other hand uh, by implementing your own like locally owned uh, electricity you also like lose like something with contractors or you know some things from the federal side and that's obviously a factor for low governments to like consider um, is that that like should not conflict with you know some other parties that would also like to get a hand on the uh, energy sector. Yeah. Yes. But but the app helps in that decision. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The app is great. Like, but there's so many other questions that are unrelated to the app. Like, what is the actual benefit of solar system? There are a lot yeah, of so people who are bashing on it. Thanks a lot, Michael. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's almost. Automatic. Thank you so much. I'll just also ask. Um, yeah. So, uh, in terms of like the usage, like going forwards, like obviously you're graduating. You know, the project is coming. Yes. Uh, do you expect this to continue to be used by like different municipalities or different uh, energy? Like, what's like the usage and versus like oh, the plans for it going right. forward? So yeah. Actually, yeah. a lot of yeah. 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 like, uh, uh, governments other than Kogo are interested in. Like, 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 like
Ideally, they could use this website like immediately now if you in their decision. While you're talking, could you bring up the map and kind of go to Kobo's again? Yeah, I want to show Michael. I want Michael. I want to show Michael something. Um, zoom in on Kobo's. The there's a so uh, it's called you know, if they want to like they want to like. Like as of right it's now, actually, they can obviously use this as a but for the future, numbers are uh, hopefully this website will be but met with the wrong. more up to date data and this functionality will just carry on right. for the exact oh, like you know like planning ahead. <laughs> ask this guy here. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Sorry, <laughs> so just curious. That's easier. You know, like what the current like numbers are in terms of people use because I mean you mentioned like oh you know um, representative was was using it. Tonko. Yeah, Tonko. That's the rep of our district. So, I don't think he's, he's speaking to my rep. Yes, he might even mention the presidential inauguration. Really? So, he might even mention this because he's been yeah. mentioning it around. Oh. Really? Wow. I'll, I'll see if I'll so look at this. So, what I clicked on. But yeah, um, so I was just curious if you happen to know what like the usage numbers were, or like how many hits is your website getting? I actually don't we did not even know is that two weeks from okay, week, mm -hmm. a week from next week. Very thing and Dr. Epson will be presenting this to NREL, which is the yeah. application that gave us the reservoir data. Oh yeah, so if they know about it's like they yeah, have yeah, they definitely know. know. Uh, and then, like they can yeah. around. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. Now look at the numbers. That's neat. It is. It's very thank you. New York State. No, thank you for showing us this project. This is, this is obviously an awful lot of work. And it is fine. It's, it's really fine to detail. I appreciated that. I am. Yeah, yeah hopefully, like, I just like, think it's like as non technical as it can. I think megawatts. Guys are definitely not. I appreciate it. Yeah, because I, I, you, I, you know, it's, it's actually jostling with a bunch of 800 lines of code. Like, I'm just going to, like, after five minutes. So I just use, like, actual S language as easy and Understandable as I could. So the regular, this is called the, this on like a higher level, and the, but also the explain the technical. talking about is actually this the reservoir behind the river. Yeah, I think it was so like, you didn't like, you like you on the river. I'm not even and so, both sides, like, both sides. So, uh, yeah, was, yeah, was like, the yeah. Was, Whenever, I just at least with this one, it doesn't look like it's out of the percentage of the public. No, no, it's really amazing like, so they, they, they have uh, this is pretty technical in my perspective yeah. but yeah. they don't expect our college like our study to tonight subject like the background we work yourself i was thank you